and welcome to tonight's session of the New York Technology Council. Delighted you're all here. Uh, as you may know, this is the last one for this season, other than our party, which is uh, coming next month. And then we go into planning mode, and we'll be back in September with uh, lots more. So let me, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, Charles to introduce uh, tonight's session in, in particular. I want to thank our sponsors. Uh, as trite as it might sound, we wouldn't be here without them. Uh, they provide the majority of our funding and enable us to put on events like this one. I want to thank NYIT for the generous uh, use of this space. We appreciate uh, they've made it available to us. And with that, let me turn it over to Charles Morrow, and uh, he's the organizer of the UX track. So, Charles, take it away. Thanks, Eric. Okay, so quickly now, uh, tonight's speakers. Uh, the first uh, speaker will be Alfonso de Muz. Um, I've known Alfonso for quite a few years. Um, he's uh, a highly experienced professional in the, in the space of uh, UX um, test and evaluation. He's CEO, I guess co-CEO, of uh, UserZoom, which is now, um, I think, the sort of go-to methodology for large sample online behavior tracking and studies. Uh, and he's based in Silicon Valley. He's come in to talk to us uh, tonight with a couple of clients. Is uh, another interesting side bit is uh, he actually played D1 uh, Division One basketball at San Jose State. And for years, I always wondered why his, his photograph was him spinning a basketball on his finger. So I didn't know that until I got his bio today. Um, second will be uh, Wilkie Wong. Uh, Wilkie is. Um, Director of Knowledge Services at uh, Toby. Uh, any of you who've been familiar with uh, eye tracking technology, uh, either by direct use or association, seen others using it, uh, Toby is uh, also the go to methodology for uh, that specific uh, form of testing. And uh, we're very happy to have uh, Wilkie here today. He'll be talking about um, eye tracking with respect to uh, mobile. But one thing I want to mention is all of the, the focus of all of these speakers is going to be on uh, testing with respect to mobile. And uh, finally, we have uh, Ania Rodriguez. She's CEO and founder of Keylime uh, Interactive uh, in Miami. Um, I've worked with her for a number of years. Uh, she's an outstanding research professional and has a, quite a successful firm in Miami. For some reason, does a lot of work in New York, too. And uh, she'll be talking about um, case studies in uh, mobile and uh, specifically uh, a new product that she's working on for the research community. OK, so uh, oh, one thing I wanted to do, uh, two additional thank yous. Uh, Emily Fisher of our firm. Emily, stand up here. You have no idea how much effort it takes to pull one of these things off. Uh, and she's been instrumental in that. And also, um, Brittany Reed um, also has been uh, very helpful in putting these together over the past year. Okay, ready to go. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Charles, for the wonderful introduction. Still play ball, by the way. Just not a Good shape as 20 years ago. Uh, it's great to be here. I love the city. Uh, I'm from Madrid, Spain, but I live in California. Silicon Valley has nothing to do with this. And I love uh, being here. So I love to, to not just be able to, to provide the talk, but also be in the city a couple days. So um, I'm going to talk to you about, to talk to you guys about remote unmoderated testing for mobile. Um, that's really the whole talk is all about that. And, um, you know, um, Here's a little bit of the overview. Basically, I want to start off with some challenges for researchers and designers um, that are building and uh, designing uh, mobile interfaces and how remote testing helps and how it compares to more traditional testing, such as you know testing in the lab, which most of you I'm sure are familiar with. And then I'll take a deep dive uh, to this um, specific um, methodology, remote unmoderated. You've noticed that I've highlighted, uh, uh, underlined uh, unmoderated because there's also remote moderated testing and uh, I want to highlight that this is an unmoderated methodology and I'll talk about the what, the, the, the good and bad or the good and not so good and, and the how and the results. All right, so um, if the computer listens to me, I'll move next. There we go. Um, okay, there's tons of vendors, tons of tools, tons of technologies. Um, most of our customers or prospects are confused. No, no, no question. There's so many of them. And uh, what we have to do is educate the market and let people know what it is that each tool does. 
And when you're selecting a tool, you have to keep in mind a certain certain you know uh, things. For example, the Go. So it's not the same to run a usability test than to do a persona uh, research or user research to define your persona. Or it's not the same to test your design your, while you're in design phase and you have a wireframe and you just want to do some <coughs> co concept testing, right? So what are the goals? You have to understand the goals to select your tool. Um, timing, of course. Uh, you know, do you have the time? Uh, sometimes now with with agile. Um, people are in a hurry and there's no time for testing. So you have to keep that in mind. And of course, the budget. Um, but there's one, another thing that is very important, which is you have to impress uh, the boss, right? Uh, and that, that actually uh, helps, helps quite a bit and it, it's becoming quite fundamental. Um, so now in the mobile world, all this that I've just said is true, right? It's the exact same thing. You still, you, you, it doesn't matter if the, if the interface is for desktop or for mobile, you still have to understand your goals, where, where you are in the, in the development cycle, et cetera, et cetera. However, as most of you, or all of you would agree, um, mobile is a world of its own. And so it's actually making it even more challenging for designers, not to mention researchers, to actually you know, come up with the best user experience possible. I think it's a nightmare, really. Um, not just because of the mobility, but also because of the how new and how recent and all um, um, you know we're, we're all learning as we go uh, and we have operating systems such as uh, you know Apple being so close and then Android and all those things all those are nothing but challenges now as we all know testing and research helps uh, uh, you know come up with the right user experience but um, I'm here to talk about, talk to you about remote um, and I'm talking about moving beyond the lab. So, um, you know, you'll never hear me say don't do lab studies. You know, I think they're great. Uh, I, I actually, this, the company that I co-founded was at the beginning more of a lab testing or, or a, we, we did most of our research in the lab and we had, uh, you know, all the technology for the lab and we had something, something set up just like this in the picture. But why I'm here today is because I think that Remote testing will rock your world. But now I have to prove it to you, okay? So let me do that in the next 15 minutes. Um, the first thing I want to show you is um, sort of the, the landscape or different methods. Again, I highlighted, as you see here, I have unmoderated down here. There's also remote moderated. A lot of people do remote moderated testing. Um, uh, it's hard. It's very hard to do that with mobile uh, because you know, for desktop, you would do WebEx or GoToMeeting or Adobe Connect or something like that. But how do you do that with mobile? Um, it's extremely challenging. There's a lot of technical difficulties. You have to project image, you have to have a camera, all those things. So I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I actually had it here. I think I had a few logos. Um, there, there's WebEx and GoToMeeting. In the unmoderated uh, world, we have also sort of two different types. Um, the qual method or small samples. Um, it's, it's hard to really categorize all of these different um, uh, vendors and methods, but you know that's how I, I uh, pretty much present it. You know, more qualitative focus uh, and and with small samples. And user testing is one of the vendors that is doing this. They they they, um, they sort of take the lab. <laughs> bless you. They sort of take the lab. Um, um, to to, re to a remote environment with the, with, in, in the cloud and they collect videos and they share those videos. But they do it with very small samples. What we do at UserZoom and what I'd like to talk to you about because that's what I know the most uh, in today's session is the quant um, large-scale testing. Um, that's where um, we at UserZoom specialize and I believe that there's, there's a bright future. I mean, obviously the company is doing really well, but it's a, it's a there's a lot of great things about quant uh, and moderated testing, um, specifically related to mobile, um, that I think are are um, are the way to go. And I will just use one word: context. Context is key for mobile. So if you're going to do testing, um, if you can do remote testing and you don't have the user in a specific, you know, lab setting or specific location, but just on the go, that's even better for the researcher. So. Context to me is key, is key, and that's why um, I, I really believe in this method. Now, how many of you understand remote unmoderated testing? 
very few yeah so that's that's what happens most of the time it's still relatively relatively new and we're all working on you know sort of educating the market or trying to trying to help people understand first how what the method is and how it works um, in this in this um, graph that I have here um, what you see is first of all uh, users uh, or participants are taking the study simultaneously um, much like a survey <clears throat> they're they're doing it uh, in their context wherever they are in this case uh, in those pictures you see computers but typically you know obviously for mobile testing they would have a, a phone um, they're participating in their participating in their natural context so that's that's very important it can be both um, you know in the national market or international and very very important in terms of um, cost effectiveness which I'll speak about in a second there's no moderation needed that's why it's called unmoderated um, what what how we substitute or how a moderated testing works instead of having a moderator is by using software and that's where technology comes in as you see here in the picture and I'll sh I have a couple of videos to show you more in detail uh, ahead but you see that there's sort of like this um, survey app um, and then there is this browser bar um, that pretty much asks users to do something to complete certain tasks this this can be searching for a hotel it can be searching for directions on how to get here like I did uh, earlier today um, etc and users have the, cap the capability of doing these tasks and um, if they find the answer um, if they find the, the, the uh, if they complete the task they can hit the green button that says success or you can label it I found it I got it or whatever and if they have an issue or a problem and they can't do it they hit the red button which is I, I want to quit the, the task um, as, a, as you'll see in a, in a minute with the video this browser bar can be minimized so it doesn't block the view of the user so it's really like taking part of a, of a, of a study a usability study in the lab but instead of having someone in front of you or being in the lab you're actually in your natural context on your own using the using the phone that's more or less how it works for the for the desktop by the way it works exactly the same thing exactly the same way um, but today is all about mobile so a um, little more info the great thing about this method is that it allows you to test large sets and uh, back to the slide on convincing the boss and uh, other stockholders or stakeholders um, the fact that you can get statistics uh, is, is pretty impressive and it always helps to make decisions and, and be confident about your decisions another great thing is the time efficiency so because you're not moderating you spend time on the initial uh, design of the study and you obviously spend time analyzing all this data but the great thing is you can launch a study and you don't have to moderate you can go on and do something else um, let, the, let the software and the users participate so typically unless it's a really complicated study you can get um, a 200 participant uh, use remote unmoderated usability study with a bunch of tasks and questions in a matter of two weeks or so sometimes maybe a little longer sometimes if you're in a hurry you can also speed it in speed it up it also depends on the on the audience of course uh, the target audience you're testing cost wise of course because you're limiting all that um, the, the time that you you're spending moderating now this is obviously our pricing there's all kinds of different uh, vendors out there and I would encourage you to, 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 to check them all out and see see what they offer but uh, you know it, it can vary between 1,000 to 5,000 per study that we also offer yearly licensing options for for the brands um, and um, you know, I'll show you a little bit of how it works in a second but I also want to emphasize this last point which I think is really really important um, one of the key challenges today is to build prototypes to build wireframes for mobile and then test them you know in, in the mobile um, so with this system you can actually test any um, any UI as long as it's hosted and it can be accessed through a browser through, through the mobile so that means that when you're building your website and you have a you're using Axure or Balsamic or you know a prototyping tool, whatever you can host, even if it's an image or a JPEG that you can upload on the iPhone or on the Android device, you can test it. So so th that's not the same. You you cannot do this with apps. Apps is, is a completely different world. But if it's a website, you can test it with um, with this method and in our case with our technology. Now some pros and cons I mean not everything is as beautiful as I'm making it look perhaps um, but there is a lot of pros and a few cons um, you know the pros obviously is that you're testing 
uh, large sets of users. This is probably you know the number one reason our customers love us is because they just they can go to so many people in different locations, uh, different profiles. The natural context that I already spoke about, the time and cost effectiveness, of course, that I also discussed. And then I also like this thing, which I'll show you in a minute uh, with some graphs, is that um, when you're testing uh, with remote unmoderated um, uh, uh, methodology and, and technology, you're not only capturing survey data, you know, responses, um, you're also capturing usability data, what I consider, you know, effectiveness ratios, efficiency ratios. And then you combine it, which is, I think, the, 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 the very, the, the biggest strength of this method is that you combine it with behavior. Um, you know, you have the analytics tools out there providing you with da traffic data and funnel analysis and things like that, but that's overall population. So it's more about the what. And then you have the usability lab that gives you, you know, the qualitative, but you're not really getting a large uh, sample. So you don't have the statistics. So this is a beautiful model because it combines both. You're getting this usability and you're getting click streams, heat maps of where people clicked. Um, uh, like you can filter and say, okay, if users failed a task, what were the, what was the path and where, where did it click? Um, how long did it, did it take them? And things like that. And then finally, uh, recently we added the video session. So now you really you can also collect the video of the uh, of the screen uh, for each user and on a task uh, on per task level. So you can go back and say again, those that failed or those that uh, have a specific profile, um, those that uh, were not satisfied, you can filter all that, and then you'll be able to get maybe you know, 10 or 15 videos, video sessions, and you can replay them and you can see exactly what they were doing. So now really with this, with this technology, you know, back to your point, Charles, this technology is basically slowly but surely replacing a lab in that sense. And again, I'll never say, you'll never hear me say, do not do tests in the lab because I recognize I would truly value, you know, the, the being able to talk to, to someone which is what I have here on the on the cons. You can't, you know, you're it's difficult to to do the the probing, and you don't have the body language. But other than that, there's probably a lot more cases where you can test uh, with remote and moderated, and actually get some great insights and great videos to again do your do your job, which is you know uh, do the research and come up with the best insights. Okay, so to show you a little bit more, um, well. Here's a, I just want to get into the how it works, but here's a little bit of the advantages. I pretty much already spoke about most of them. Um, I want to show you some numbers because I, 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 I think I think you'd appreciate this as well. So um, let's talk about return on investment and cost effectiveness. So we have a total time to conduct a study in, in, in a lab. It's more or less three to six weeks. Um, session you know, moderation, 60 minutes per, per user, more or less, and 5 to 15 uh, participants. And then there's, there's the analysis time. And the average cost, I'm sure here in New York City, is much more expensive than that, but I'm just taking you know, uh, some, some um, big numbers. And I think um, this is actually um, uh, holds true as well. So easily one to two weeks is what it takes, zero time dedicated to moderation. Um, you do not have to do hundreds of users all the time. As a matter of fact, in many cases, and this is actually taken out of, a, of a, one of our best customers, uh, e-commerce company, that uh, you know most of their studies between 50 to 100, and you can still get some great data. So it's not recruiting is not a it's not a, a nightmare, although it's important. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, but sometimes you know like. One of our customers, best customers, is Google, and they do sometimes a thousand users or, or, or more. So it really all depends on your goals. But again, um, they're all participating remotely, so um, it's not like you have to bring them all to the lab. Um, the time for analysis and reporting really varies. I'm sure you know, depending on how complex the study is. But generally speaking, I'm I'm using average numbers here. Three to four days is more than enough. And then I'm taking three to five thousand dollars in terms of cost. Uh, on, on, on each study. So then, of course, the more studies you do, the more you save. And that's where some of these companies that work with us that are doing maybe 20, 30, 50, sometimes even more studies per year, depending on how many properties they have, 
that's where they can really save uh, you know, a lot of money on, on moderated testing. And this is definitely one of the reasons this is becoming a very popular uh, methodology. Okay, so moving on, I want to show you, especially most of you are new to this method, I have about, I think, five uh, steps and some videos to show you specifically dedicated for mobile. Okay, so let's see how it works. First of all, in our case, once again, this is user zoom. There's plenty of other vendors out there. Um, maybe not that many, but um, this is, this is uh, becoming popular. Um, important to tell you that this is a SaaS model, right? It's on demand. You just log in with your login and password and you, uh, define, you design, design your study, you have your data and everything is in the cloud. Everything is um, accessible through your account. So, you know, you would log in like any other, you know, uh, SaaS business. You, um, you set up your study and setting up a, a remote unmoderated um, test is, I'm gonna say, like doing a survey on steroids. <laughs> it's like, you can ask questions, you can, um, you can, um, uh, you, you're gonna have uh, users simultaneously and participating in on their own. But the difference here is that you have questions and I think I have a slide here. Yeah, well, it's hard to tell the difference, but the, the, what, I, what I'm showing here is that you can create tasks, like I said earlier, right? Search for something, um, try to buy or register or whatever. These are uh, tasks that you would want a, a participant to, to do. And what you have to do when you're in this type of, um, when you're using remote and moderated testing is you have to um, really think and plan what it is that you want to do. Because again, you're not gonna moder moderate, right? So you want to make sure that everything is nicely set up and you have ways of previewing and pre-testing and launching it to a few, a few users before you launch it to the whole group um, of panelists. Um, you know, all of those options, all of those options are there. But again, as you see in the screen, you have you can you can create a task and you set the URL where you want the users to go. That's what's beautiful about this is that the URL it can be a live website, it can be a prototype, as long as it's on a server and you can be accessed through the browser. That's where you would um, where where you would um, enter right here on the starting URL, and you would have a description for the task, and that's where users are going to head over for that specific task. Another nice thing about this is that there's no there's no need for installation or for adding any code with this method. Um, no need to add any code to the website. So if you want to check your competitor's website and test it with another set of users, you can do it. Um, that's actually a pretty interesting thing and um, pretty po pretty powerful. Frequently asked question is um, the uh, recruiting and. Um, you know, let me spend a minute here discussing recruiting. So there's essentially two ways for, for you to do uh, mobile unmoderated testing, a remote, um, uh, remote testing. One would be to use a panel. And so we work with those four panels that you see there, four panel vendors. Uh, what they do is they, they can basically go out there and find you the users. It's the same thing as uh, when you're uh, trying to gather, trying to, trying to uh, get 10 users into the lab, but you're gonna need maybe 50 or 100 or 200, 300 users you have to work with a, with a, a reliable professional panel that has a, a database, and they they are dedicated to that. Um, you know, we, we chose not to do this in, in at UserZoom because it's a business of its own, and you want to make sure that the users are the right users. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how great the, the, the researcher is, or it doesn't matter how great the technology is. You have to take care of those. Um, now, the other option is that you can send a, a, an email. You can send an email invitation. And so you could have your private panel, your private list of users to, to invite, and certainly you can, you can get them to, to participate. Typically, um, you want to compensate them, right? Now, when you're in the lab, again, comparing traditional methods, when you're in the lab, you're gonna be thinking of what? Maybe, I mean, here in New York City, what is it, 100, 120, 150 bucks, <laughs> even higher? With, uh, with the remote unmoderated testing, you know, we're looking at more or less about 20 to $25 because, um, and that's, that's actually sometimes even counting the recruiting. So maybe the incentive is, hey, spend 10, 15 minutes with us, sometimes half an hour, you maybe wanna up that incentive more. But if you're spending 15 minutes or so, and again, you're in your, your natural context, you're just running and you're, or you're at a coffee shop or you're at home and you just spend 15 minutes participating in a study, you know, 
a lot of users do it for 10, 15, 20, 25 bucks. So you can see the, the difference there. Okay, I have a video here to show you how it works from the participant's perspective, okay? So let me see if it works on the screen. What you see here is an email with an invitation link. And in our case, now again, I'm showing you user Zoom technology. In our case, you have a, a download uh, of a survey app. Uh, so this is the first thing that shows. Office Depot is just a pilot study we put together for them. Um, so you'd go into the Apple Store or the Android Store, um, and you would install a very thin, very simple app. And when the user opens it, um, it asks for starting the study. At this point, this is a survey app, which is like a browser. It's really our own browser. And everything that you see here is something that I've previously designed in the previous screens that I was showing you, right? So for example, simple demographic questions, such as these over here. And you're gonna be able to filter the data afterwards, depending on, on all these questions, of course. Um, there's plenty of different types of, of, of questions, open-ended or multiple choice or whatever. Here's, a, here's the, the big thing. So this is a task. And in this case, you want to buy a Swingline DX20 you know, uh, shredder. So this is a very typical navigation search task, you know, trying to, trying to find a product. And you see that's the browser bar at the bottom that first shows and then it hides, allowing the user to do the, the, to do the task. You can up it and, and, or, or show it and hide it anytime you want to. Every keystroke, everything, all the, you know, the behavior, um, the, the path the users are taking, the time it's taking for this task, and um, the gestures, which is a brand new thing we just launched last week, and the videos, which it looks very much like this, but I'll show you in a minute, all of that is being captured as the users are, are, are doing this. So again, you see the, the, the buttons that say, I'm done. You can also label it, I found it, or whatever. You can change the label per, on a per task level. Um, so again, this is, very much like a usability study, but users can participate in their natural context, and you get hundreds of users doing this if you want to, or even, or even 50. And then, um, so let me pause it here real quick, because this is very important. <clears throat> this, uh, this previous question here is a, well, well no, never mind, but it was a multiple choice. Basically, you want to validate you want to validate the users got the right answer. So in this case, if there was a price or a specific model or whatever, um, you want to validate it. And how do you do that? Through a validation question. It comes right after the, the task. And so if the user clicks on the green button and answers the, the right question, the system automatically validates, automatically um, says, okay, user got this task successfully. If they click on the red button, they are actually sent to a different questionnaire, what we call the failure questionnaire. And that's different. That is, okay, you quit, tell us why, what happened, can you suggest? And then, of course, is the follow-up questionnaire, which allows them to give you suggestions, comments, rating, you know, the design or whatever. So very, very interactive type of, of test um, and, and um, you know, survey slash test is, is how I like to say it. What about results? So um, usability uh, uh, results, uh, such as effectiveness ratio, you know, you see the, the red and the green, um, how many people actually got each task correctly, how many abandoned. And then on the right, you have time on task, you have the count on a per you for, you know, for how many users, the percentage, um, you have um, like, uh, what is the maximum, minimum, and standard the, the, the average for, um, for the time that they spent on each task. Now, over here in pink, you have a, like a breakdown of users that abandoned or users that got what we call disasters, which is that they thought they got the right answer, but when they clicked on the multiple choice, they selected the wrong one. Uh, that happens sometimes, and um, that's actually a very important moment to ask them why, and so that's how you can break the different uh, follow-up questions depending on what they did. So these are what we call you know, usability uh, data. And then 
um, as I said earlier, the beauty of this model is that you can combine uh, usability ratios and, user and survey data with behavior. So this is an example of a click stream. Um, you obviously can't see much, but each box represents a URL and represents the behavior, you know? And this would be an aggregate of everybody, but what you can do is you can filter and say, I want to see the paths that uh, people that abandoned took, for example, or specific profile. What that gives you is, again, the analytics portion that Google Analytics or Omniture gets you, but in this case, you know the intent. You know what the user was trying to do. Um, I like Net Promoter Score. In this case, you know, um, the, uh, it's a great way because it's not just memory, like, you know, they, they think of your brand or whatever. There's a lot of Net Promoter Score uh, companies that do surveys. But in this case, hey, if you've had a bad experience, there's, there's a clear relation between MPS and uh, the effectiveness ratios. So if you've had a bad experience after three or four tasks, chances are you're not gonna be uh, a promoter, right? And then last but not least, let me show you a couple of videos of what we are able to provide uh, in the dashboard. So if you log into your account, you can see these videos right here. Um, so just a few seconds each, but it shows you this is actually a video from one user. We get a video per user per task. So this is a video recording of our marketing manager taking part of this pilot study yesterday. Uh, you can basically replay every single session. And again, these videos uh, are based on the filters that you produce. So if you want to see you know, 10, 20 videos of users that failed, you can do that. You can watch them and then watch them on our dashboard and download them as well. So I'm playing them right now on Charles' computer because it was already downloaded. I also wanted to show you this other one, which is very much the same, but I like this one because it does have this nice thing, which is that this user is in a different, um, in a different website, but as you're gonna see, we also collect gestures. So you can, pin, you can, you can get the pinching and the zooming. It actually shows you two little, yeah, you see? So that's someone in California participating on their phone, on a study, on a specific task. And again, you probably get hundreds of these if you've tested all of them, but or if you want, you tested 100 users, and you'd be able to get behavior as well. Um, just about, I have two more slides. What I want to show you here is that you can do competitive testing. I also think that's a great strength of remote unmoderated testing. And in this case, we did it for mobile and we did it for four brands. Actually, in this case, not for cell phones, but we did it for, uh, for tablets. So we, what we did is a fashion tablet competitive study. We tested those four brands. All of that was done internally by our marketing team. Um, and we just did it to, you know, to, to, to show off um, and to see what, what, what we could do. Um, what we asked is, I think it was like 50 women to go to each of these brands. Uh, we only tested women and uh, they used an, an, um, an iPad or an Android uh, or a tablet. And um, here's, the, here's the, um, the data. So for example, success rate um, on these columns over here and some comments they made, like reason why on, on, the, on the users that didn't succeed, uh, they were making some comments, and so we captured those those, those comments. Uh, so competitive testing, and then here's the here's the um, the MPS on a per brand level. I think this is wonderful, really, because now you have the chance of saying, okay, um, if I'm you know if I'm Guess or Kenneth Cole, I'm thinking, well, how am I doing? What is, what is 63 percent good? Is is my my success rate good? So not only are you understanding or you know um, capturing the behavior through, you know, watching the videos and um, and the question and the comments, but you're also getting the quant, the, the statistics with MPS and ratings, and you can compare, you know. So now, um, finally, the reporting. So we were just talking about this earlier, Charles, about how beautiful it is to be able to just click on a button and output and here comes the output um, we are able to produce word document powerpoint excel 
and SPSS. And the Excel can be raw data, so you can do po mo more post analysis and, and really some of our customers do a lot of crunching um, and stuff. So that's great because you can collect all this. I showed you the, the process of collecting. Everything is obviously in your account um, automatically and on real time. And then you can just hit the button and get a PowerPoint report with pretty much all those graphics that I showed you. So it saves time and like we, like we like to say, it helps you scale your research as a, as a designer and researcher. It just helps you do more with less. Okay, so my last slide is some key takeaways. I think I'm more or less on the half an hour right here. So I have to be respectful for the next speakers. Um, I, I think I gave you a lot of stuff and uh, you know, terms, trying to summarize it in six key takeaways here is that you know, mobile UX design is, is, is crazy and, and very challenging. And we have to figure it out. Um, you know, testing obviously and research is becoming essential, but testing is difficult and it's very expensive and cost of, and, and time consuming. So remote testing can help uh, in that sense, as long as technology works, as long as the method is, is, is sound and, and, and solid, um, you can be innovative with remote and moderated testing. Um, clearly the benefits to me are basically three, there's plenty of them I think, but three are the cost effectiveness. Um, actually I would say the large samples, I think I should, I should have added that there. Cost effectiveness, the agility, the speed, the, you know, you can do this, especially for agile, um, you know, you're working in sprints and sometimes doing this real quick and getting feedback is, is obviously very valuable. Um, and then of course the context, in the case of mobile, more than ever, it's about context. Even if the technology is sort of replacing a little bit of the human labor, um, you still are not really paying a huge price. You're actually getting extremely detailed and actionable data. So it's not like you're giving up. I mean, you are giving up the, the contact, so sometimes you may want to do the lab, but again, with remote testing, you can just get so much data to play with. And finally, that uh, you don't only have to uh, test uh, live websites. You can test any uh, UI whether it's a prototype or screen or whatever, and even your competitor's site. It's sometimes it's really cool. Okay, and so that's it for, for me. Thank you very much for your attention. I think we have Q&A later, right? Yes, Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, having me here today. A couple of others digging into my thigh. All right. Um, my name is Wilkie Wong, and uh, I'm the Director of Knowledge Services at Toby Technology. Uh, I am uh, not just a, uh, a shill for eye tracking, which obviously my company produces, I'm also a user. Uh, and I first came into contact with the eye tracking during my dissertation when I was able to secure some grant funding, purchase my very first eye tracker, and that got me off and running. Uh, my background is in behavioral and psychological sciences, and that's sort of going to be my perspective. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is sort of a practical perspective on the use of eye tracking uh, in regards to mobile, uh, mobile device testing. And uh, uh, some of the ideas that I'm going to touch on today are going to dovetail well with the preceding talk, as well as the talk that's going to follow. Because eye tracking can be a part of a, of, a, of a comprehensive approach, a suite of tools with which you can attack usability issues. So let's go ahead and get started. It has been said that the eyes are the window to the soul. Okay. And certainly when you admire a uh, masterpiece such as anybody, what's the name of this? Girl with Pearl Earring, right? Extra points for the painter. Yeah. Vermeer, that's right, Girl with Pearl Earring uh, by Vermeer. The eyes are the mirror, are the window to the soul. However, in the enterprise of eye tracking, we're not so much concerned with the soul as we are with the mind. Oh, it's a little offset because it's scaled. Sorry. Uh, the eyes are the window to the mind, and that is the entire premise behind eye tracking. Eye tracking is a behavioral method. There are things that are measurable; they are captured by equipment, devices, algorithms, uh, and uh, specifically, we measure the movement of the eyes, the stuff up here, to allow us to infer processes that are occurring back here in the gooey gray stuff. All right. Uh, because it's a behavioral method, 
and because of its particular um, uh, approach to uncovering behavior, eye tracking can un uncover uh, something that's very, very, very simple description uh, of, of what it can achieve. Um, clearly, it's, it's, uh, it's a complicated technology. It's got a lot of uh, mathematics and optoelectronics behind it. But if uh, your priest or your vicar or your, or your rabbi were to ask you, you know, here you guys are doing eye tracking now, what, what is it? Well, eye tracking can simply be described as a method that allows you to determine when and where users look and for how long. That's really all there is to it. However, as simple as that is, that allows us to make inferences and statements, judgments, and comparisons regarding attentional processes and performance. And that's sort of at the root of the whole endeavor about uh, user experience testing. Okay, thank you. Um, so, eye tracking is a behavioral method that it uncovers uh, these connections between eye movements and cognitive processes. Um, that's what it does, but why would you use it in, in, in uh, user experience? Well, there are three primary reasons. First is to discover the cause of usability or design problems in a confirmatory mode. So if you're doing a study and you find out that, hey, um, users seem not to be clicking on this, or they report that they don't recall something, uh, or they're bombing out of the funnel at a certain point, you have specific information about the failure. But you may not have verifiable information about the mode of that failure, what exactly is preceding that, that process. So eye tracking can uncover the cause of usability and design issues that may, be, um, may, may have been discovered in a, in a prior or preceding study. The second goal is to identify real meaningful differences. And by this, I mean if you have multiple design candidates or you have current and, and a proposed design, eye tracking, uh, when done in more of a quantitative fashion, can give you the basis for calculating statistics, differences, uh, tendencies that translate to meaningful differences, meaning um, a difference that makes a difference. Is uh, a percentage, uh, is, is the viewing percentage of 90% versus 70% meaningful? Does it translate to some other performance indicator that's of value to, to the business or to the, uh, to the client? And again, uh, this relates to two, two factors. Attentional performance and past pages performance. Attentional leads to questions uh, of, about um, visibility, search efficiency. Past based performance also leads to search processes and the ability to uh, make sense, make sense, and then execute on on the sense that's that's built into that um, that uh, interface. The third goal is uh, one that's become more prevalent, prevalent nowadays, and it seems to become uh, an easier thing to speak about, and that is to solve worthwhile business or commercial issues. In years past, uh, over I'd say even as, as recently as uh, three to five years ago, um, you could almost sell eye tracking on, on the virtues of uh, having presented a heat map alone, because it's flashy, it's visual, it's, it's amazing, it's, it's just super cool. Well, those days are pretty much long gone. Um, it, it, the key, key part of uh, including eye tracking as part of your, your tool arsenal is to make that connection between the findings uh, how, and, and, and stating how meaningful they are with respect to business and commercial issues. And we'll see how, that is, um, how that's translated in, in an upcoming slide. So if we, if we accept that the point of eye tracking, as any other tool is to ask, is to find the key questions to ask, answer them, uh, and then solve problems that count, what are some of these question problem combinations? For example, one might be interested in where users look. Where do people look? When they come to this landing page, where do they look? Well, why would you want to know that? You'd want to know how attention is deployed. You want to know where the strong attentional attractors are on your page. You might even want to know what, what, the, what the overall visual flow is given a particular task or context. Why? Well, one reason might be to place ads or other materials in the appropriate positions where they'll, get, where they'll get the most exposure and viewing. Not just the fact that the page has loaded and shown it, but the fact that you actually have 
measurable uh, viewing and attention to it. Second is, well, we have an idea where they're looking, but I'd like to know what they're missing. What about this interface that I'm spending an awful lot of time and effort developing and studying do users really don't make use of? What should, where should I be spending my development time? Uh, and if you're interested in branding, well, question, an associated question might be, why, why is my branding or my messaging not getting through? Well, people aren't looking at it. And eye tracking is a tool um, that can tell you with some specificity and certainty what, pe what things people are and are not looking, looking at. Okay. Third, third example might be, well, what causes bounce? From the analytics or from user studies, but certainly from the analytics, um, you might know that, hey, everybody seems to move along this funnel just fine until they get to about step five or six or so, and then it falls off the cliff. Well, you've got the numbers, uh, and it, they're real. It's, it's real data. But you may not have enough to, to tease out the actual cause. What are the mechanics? What are the visual and perceptual processes associated with that particular page that make it so problematic? And understanding the cause once the nexus where that bounce occurs allows you to apply, study and apply uh, solutions to fix the particular issues on that, uh, on that portion of the funnel, thereby raising conversion. There's the KPI. And uh, the final one that I'll present today is in, with respect to e-commerce. Are the specials seen? Are people using coupons? Are they seeing the recommendations or the reviews? Mm. We, we obviously put a lot of effort into recommendation algorithm. We care about pe why people see these. Why? Because we want to increase the basket, the average total sale. We want to, we want to maximize and take advantage of every opportunity to cross sell. Because, if it it, because in order to provide value and benefit to the client, you have to make sure that they see it. You have to ensure that they see it. And eye tracking can help illuminate the reasons behind these failures and behaviors so that you can direct it towards key commercial interests. Now, as far as usability testing of mobile devices, there are a number of methods. Right? There are non-eye tracking methods, such as paper comps and wireframes. I was just at a client this, earlier this week that worked with a number of wireframes uh, and eye tracking, but primarily it's a, it's a non-eye tracking methodology. There are a number of video capture methods as well including projectors, uh, customized sleds, that's an oldest unit, uh, and screen capture. Um, screen capture. But we're primarily concerned with eye tracking methodologies. Okay? And in eye tracking methodologies, there are three primary approaches. There are head-mounted solutions. Okay? I'm going to talk a little bit about today, the conditions of use. There are mobile stand solutions. Why would you choose a stationary stand solution for testing mobile devices? And mobile dock solutions. So a very important point was made regarding context of study. So get the, get the people, you know, get the study out of the lab. Get them into their actual use context. Um, just as you would with uh, an unmoderated remote study, there are, new, there are various eye tracking methodologies and approaches uh, that allow you to basically take this methodology out into the field, out into the actual physical context, uh, where the where the tech where the um, the site or the app is accessed, and we'll, we'll examine them in a little bit more detail. So, let's proceed. Mobile device eye tracking, three ways. Here we go. The glasses. The glasses are Toby's approach to head-mounted eye tracking. And head-mounted eye tracking means an eye tracker mounted to your head. Glasses, right? So you might see, you might uh, you might consider these as similar to 3D shutter glasses, or those who who have uh, who've experienced uh, 3D you know virtual environments where you have head tracking. They're they're comparable in size and weight to those sort of systems. Uh, the eye tracker is built into the glasses, so that basically um, once you put these put these put this eye tracker on your, your participant, they can be tested anywhere uh, in any fashion, um, from lying down, sitting at a table, reclining at the couch, um, working at the table uh, again. Um, the other thing is, oh, I've got a little bit squished. 
Um, the glasses are the solution to use uh, this type of head-mounted eye tracking system. It's appropriate if your application has uh, some sort of um, uh, augmented reality function or if it relies on sort of a location or bodily awareness, so sort of an orientation aspect to it. The glasses uh, head-mounted system uh, allow you to, um, to eye track um, naturalistically in those functions, sort of something like this. Okay, Dunkin' Donuts, that way, and away I go. So, um, glasses, the primary keyword here is freedom, test anywhere, test anyhow, head-mounted systems. The other type of system, the other type of system that, uh, that can be used to test mobile devices is a stand-based solution. Uh, there are a number of uh, approaches to this. There's the first and second generation solutions. Uh, that's actually a prototype up there. Um, the second generation unit does look like, doesn't exactly look like that. But a stand-based solution offers precision and control. And this is the unit, this is the type of configuration that's most suited for traditional lab environments. So you have a controlled environment in terms of desk, chair, lighting, moderator, uh, cameras, microphones, the whole shebang. The stand is, uh, is appropriate to use in those settings. Um, it provides very high resolution tracking. Uh, now, when you're talking about a mobile phone, you can have features as small as two millimeters, separated by distance of just a couple of millimeters. And in certain studies, in one study that I was involved in, that I'll mention a little bit later, um, you're, actually in, you're actually interested in resolving features to that degree. And the stand-mounted solution, uh, where the device is uh, stationary to a holder with an eye tracker and then a scene camera um, uh, attached to the system, allows you to resolve very fine eye movements. Uh, furthermore, it provides really um, um, a very, a very controlled basis for the operation of the device. Now, uh, the phone can still be rotated around, the iPad can be moved from portrait to landscape, um, but you're controlling a number of things uh, uh, if, your, if your study permits it, if natural behavior for that particular study permits it, which means um, the pinching and zooming, the swiping, the, the movement through the different pages, uh, it's entirely appropriate for that type of study. Um, this type of system generally uh, supports more streamlined analysis. Now, mm. time for analysis is always a consideration. Um, the, 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 and each one of these systems has cost benefits associated with it. The great freedom of the glasses system is offset by additional, more manual requirements on the analysis of that data. As you might imagine, the phone is moving around in physical space as the person is either using it or navigating in an environment. Uh, with both the user and the eye tracker uh, and, and the device as well uh, located in a fairly controlled uh, fixed relationship, um, you have access to tools that can streamline your analysis. And what does that mean? It means uh, if you're doing something like a 12 or 15 participant study, you've got five or six tasks and uh, maybe 25, or 30, 30, 25 to 35 minutes of total time, you're talking about spending possibly two days to, to conduct the analysis once you've got once you've got a little practice with the system, so uh, the stand offers uh, the best precision, best control suitable for lab environments. The third class of solution is uh, is is the dock solution, and dock solutions provide flexibility and power. You can call them docks. You can call them specialized cases. What they are is uh, um, a frame or a case or a mount. Uh, to which you attach an eye tracker and the device, like that. Uh, what are the benefits of the dock type system? It's ideal for both home and lab use. Nowadays, we're seeing more interest in second screen studies, especially by media, media companies. So the Time Warners of the world, the Nielsen's of the world, they're interested in not just viewing to a large screen, but also to the small second screen that has the synced content with it. And the dock solution is, is a fairly effective approach to doing so. Because the person can just pick up the iPad, and as they're watching Breaking Bad with the, uh, with the synchronized information, they can be tweeting, they can be executing social functions, they can be looking at uh, you know, trivia uh, related to that particular uh, episode. So the dock solution is ideal for home and lab, 
I would say that in this case, the lab sort of overlaps with the home now. Uh, it's suitable for all mobile devices, from tablets to uh, iPads to iPhones. Um, we also have a client using it for a custom-made device for um, inventory scanning. Uh, this, this is also very useful for that. Um, and it allows free handling, free handling. So um, if that aspect of the interaction is important for your study, then the dock uh, is a suitable solution. Okay. And what do you look for in terms of um, um, analytical and reporting capabilities. Um, most systems uh, that, that allow testing a mobile, that support testing mobile devices now, uh, provide compelling visualization of attention. Uh, the classic ones are base plots and heat maps. And they're available uh, on whether the device is, is a phone or a tablet. Okay. Gaze plot, of course, tells order of looking, order of looking, and that's implicated in search efficiency and efficiency of the layout. Uh, heat maps are representations of the distribution of visual attention. And it tells you uh, where people look the most, where people don't look. Um, those heat maps. Uh, the other thing that you may be looking for uh, is the ability to generate pers persuasive and uh, objective quantitative metrics. Um, Using the systems uh, that I've mentioned before, you're able to set up areas of analysis, whether they are uh, actually in the physical world, such as buttons, uh, home buttons, or volume buttons, uh, as well as uh, virtual elements uh, of the interface, and generate metrics that are meaningful uh, for answering questions, again, about attention and performance. Attention and performance. What is seen, what is not seen, um, how, uh, how well a user can ex execute a particular task on an interface. And in all of these uh, approaches, uh, in all your studies, you're likely to encounter the question of what counts as natural behavior. Clearly, you've got head-mounted units. You've got units that allow you to eye track while the person is holding an iPad, and other units that, that uh, require that they sit down in front of the device. The question of what counts as natural behavior is still a question that's open and being asked uh, today. Uh, the key here is to define natural in the context of the task. Right? If you have an unboxing where you're actually working in physical space, uh, when you want to see how people access the printed materials, uh, then perhaps uh, a head-mounted unit uh, eye tracking is appropriate. However, if you have um, relatively more fixed relationships between the devices, um, and the, and the user, uh, then you may use uh, one of the other methods, whether it's the dock or the stand solution. Uh, you also want to consider task and episode length. Um, I haven't seen uh, actually people doing studies on mobile devices that have lasted as long as traditional desktop studies, um, 15, 20 minutes, 25 minutes at the most, whereas desktop studies uh, I've seen run as long as 45, 50, or 60 minutes or longer. Uh, that is one consideration because of the fatigue aspect and also the, the constant change uh, in relationship between the eye tracker and the participant. Um, so uh, the key thing here is to define what's, what's natural, meaning what is meaningful and likely to affect uh, interaction and performance in the task. Um, I just want to briefly touch on uh, two, two, two quick cases. Uh, in one case, there's an iPhone uh, application design. Uh, it was a commodities trading application, and uh, the stand solution was used. Uh, the study was actually executed on the floor of the Mercantile Exchange. So it was done in situ, where the, uh, where the participants were. You have to take it out to where your participants are, so, as you mentioned. And in this case, it was, on, it, it was commodities traders on the floor of the Mercantile Exchange. Uh, and they were interested in redesigning their application, uh, and they're interested in assessing the visibility of, uh, of information on information-dense tables and figures, some very, very tightly packed table structures. Uh, they're interested in search and findability of key information. Um, although all the information, all the tasks, uh, information that they asked the users to find on, in the tasks could be found in the application, they found that, that a significant proportion, somewhere around 50%, actually ended up going out and going to the main website. They were so frustrated they couldn't use it. Uh, and what they were able to do by eye tracking is to uncover where that process went off the rails, at what point 
that uh, and what what led up to that degree of frustration when they said, "Oh, you know, heck, I, I just have to open up a browser because I can't find what I need to find." They're also also interested in studying user strategies. Okay. And next case, this tablet ad study. The tablet ad study is emblematic of uh, of, of one of the fundamental questions, and that is how do um, how do people behave on similar or identical uh, websites on PCs versus tablet or mobile presentations? The question underlying that is how similar should they be? What are the visual behaviors that are the same or that different? How can we quantify and study those differences? So this client was interested in studying uh, PC versus tablet displays with respect to visibility, noticeability, and engagement to content and ad elements. Um, one thing that we discovered in this work was that uh, the hand does play a factor. Right? So in the case of a phone, it's the thumb. Uh, in the case of an iPad, it could be the hand. Um, and handedness of the user has some small effect on, on use of, of certain sites, depending on the design. And uh, I'm just about to wrap up here. So let's go to the takeaways. The first, uh, first point, of course, is that testing on mobile platforms is increasing. Right? Um, I've attended the Mobile Commerce Forum uh, for a year or two running now, when, uh, and uh, there's always a great degree of interest. Um, diverse use leads to diverse testing contexts. So again, is the appropriate testing context the lab? Uh, is it the home? Is it remote? Is it a coffee shop? Is it, you know, what is the context of use? That's going to determine, to some degree, what our methodology will be. And the third is to uh, seek and solve practical problems of commercial and business value. Um, in other words, technology, like any other technology or tool, has to pay its way. And the fourth and final point is that key user UX insights are easy. Because the same questions that you're, you're, you would be asking with respect to attention and performance on test, uh, desktop implementations are going to be the same questions you're going to be asking about mobile devices. However, grand wonderments remain to be solved, such as what are the differences between mobile and desktop instances? What does that mean for performance um, and, uh, and visual attention? Uh, of course, choose the technical solution that best suits your usage case, and your analytical needs. And uh, I'd be glad to take questions at the end. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, New Tech and Charles Morrow, for inviting me to, to be part of this event. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here in New York City um, this week. Um, and I'm excited to, to be giving you this talk today. Uh, today I'm going to take a little bit of a different spin than what my uh, colleagues here have uh, presented. Just a little bit of background about who uh, Keylime is. We are a user research firm, as Charles mentioned, and we do a variety of different types of methods, and including eye tracking and remote usability testing. So I'm going to talk through a little bit about the history of that. We have a really nice case of, of different clients that we you know, that we serve, Fortune 500 clients, and we work with agencies just, such as Morrow New Media and a number of others. Um, before we get started, I'm going to have some fun liven up things here. Just to, since we're talking about mobile, I wanted to see who in the room knows which is the movie that first featured a, a cell phone. And I gave you five options here. Go ahead and just... Uh, no. Actually, it was 16 Candles. And in 16 Candles, uh, if you recall, he had the Rolls Royce and they actually featured the old school big phone, mafia looking phone that we all recall back in 1984. Well, I think there's actually a better first mobile phone. Okay, I think that was really the first mobile phone. All right, well, um, so today, like I said just a moment ago, we're going to cover some interesting topics. So I'm going to talk uh, about the evolution of these tools. There's been a number of tools and you heard about two of them. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about innovating and really what is happening from a research perspective and why sometimes you need to find a mix of tools uh, to really get to questions to answer what is best about the digital ecosystem. And granted, if you are building a site or app or a variety of different things, uh, you're going to be asking questions that most of the time not one tool is going to solve. And that's sort of the challenge that is happening uh, for, for research in a whole. Uh, and I'll present two case studies. 
As Charles mentioned, I also have a solution that I'm going to kind of present towards the end that is something that we've come up to solve some of the questions, very similar to Alfonso's solution, um, and, but we'll talk through that at the end. Okay, so obviously smartphones have been out there for a long time, but sorry, cell phones in general, but really, really, um, when you start looking at you know, the incidence of research coming around, uh, you know, smartphones, it, it really didn't start happening until about 2007. And, and you even have like Norman Nielsen Group and a number of others later coming up with guidelines. If you don't know who they are, they, they come up with some guidelines and they come up later in like 2008, 2009 and the like. Um, back in there on those years, you know, before that, people were testing, obviously they were testing more the ergonomics of the phone and some of the interface, some of the functions, but when we're talking smartphones, iPhone comes up in 2007, and, and just like today, we're still seeing, and Alfonso showed a slide, we're still seeing that you know, there's, there's people testing with sleds. And um, these sleds, they, you, know, you can go on YouTube, you can find them, people make them as cheap as 100 bucks, and they're, you can even go cheaper if you want these things. Um, and, and there was also, at that time, you know, the projector systems that teachers used to use, people used to use that, because there really wasn't a good way to reflect what was on the image uh, onto something that someone could be observing, right? And so, so that happened. Um, prior to that, even earlier than that, SMI, which is a competitor to Toby, um, they had a solution before the glasses that Toby and then also SMI came up with later that, that was baseball cap to help you do these mobile studies. And that baseball cap, you see that study that I did, <laughs> you had to prop, it was a pain, okay? But they were really, they were sort of, in that perspective, they had that solution that if you really needed to have something that was more, uh, less restrictive and more natural to, to testing, you could use. Around that time, um, on, the, on, on the other side, tools that were similar to what um, Alfonso's tool uh, is today, uh, Keynote, Web, which is another company, was coming along with a tool that allowed you to run task-based studies on the phone on moderated, and that came in around the 2008 timeline. So I, as I mentioned just a moment ago, we see standards start coming around mobile usability in the beginning of 2009. Um, in 2010, that's when Toby um, introduces their eye tracking glasses. In uh, 2011, um, SMI introduces their binocular glasses. Um, which is, you know, a variant of, of those. Um, and then we see um, 2012, which you, uh, Alfonso mentioned them a little bit, usertesting.com, which a lot of companies um, used as a quick and dirty way to get, you know, quick insights. They um, had built up a panel and they said, you know what, we're just going to start sending people cameras and then they, these panelists that we have, they can do studies at home because the challenge that was happening is that Folks wanted quick and dirty solutions to do mobile testing, but it was expensive, like as Ponce was mentioning. We also saw competitors kind of coming in and rolling in. Um, in 2012, there's a company called Usualytics, which I think now may, may or may not be around. Um, they also started saying, well, um, around the time the iPhone 4 came out, you could reflect what was on the screen to screens, and then you could have users be at home and you know use and run a study, but they had to be in front of their computer, they had to have special software installed, they had to be part of your panel, etc. And then we learned around late 2012, uh, UserZoom uh, launches an, an intercept variant, which means that you know if you had uh, if you had um, a, a site that you had control over, and we ran one for Miami and Beaches, which uh, the convention center, and you you basically could intercept mobile visitors coming to the site. And you could ask them questions about the experience, two minute survey, really, if you think about it like that. But it was beautiful because, hey, you had no insights, you didn't know. And sometimes Apple and, and Android would restrict your, your really, you were only getting um, information that was on your app store. So you wanted to get more. What's happening? What's not happening? And you'd wanted to get geographic reach. So, beautiful solution for that, that time. In 2012, we, saw, we started seeing there was a, a sort of a, still a need. Um, we, um, we developed an internal solution that we did a beta test with and, and now we have available, we had, you know, beta previews by, in other words, they had tested it at AT&T, Cars.com, CarMax, Insurance. We had a good number of folks that have been using, kind of testing our tools to see, and they were part of our beta trial, which ended just recently. Um, our solution, which uh, is very similar, you're going to learn a little bit, it, it really is uh, more of a, not a quantitative solution, but it's more of a qualitative solution, but it, it's very similar to what Alfonso showed. It's actually, the videos are very similar in everything. 
Um, around that time, that's when Alfonso's uh, user zoom launches their their variants, which is quantitative. And 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 the, in that case, um, at that time, you had to install. You had to be still part. You know, you had to have access to the code base. So you can install certain technology now. It allows you to do it without, and it, and it releases their video playback, as you mentioned. So that's that's really what's happening during that time. Okay. So. On the other side of things, and I, I, uh, I, if you haven't had a chance, if you get some time and you can come back and play back a YouTube video, um, I, I, I'm highlighting this because as a, on the research side of things, for the last, whatever, 15, 20 years that I've been doing research, the methods have been exactly the same, right? So yeah, there's these different variances, but the testing, the, what you're trying to get out of it, are people successful? Is it, um, are people, is, a, is, a, is, your interface, is your interface efficient? Is it, um, are they satisfied? Are they gonna return? The questions that it's answering has been around for a long time. In fact, if you think about in the 70s, you know, AT&T and the like were doing studies and it's been, it's been pretty stagnant through time. Um, and it's not that the methods are bad, it's just that as we evolve and we're growing to an area where uh, question, the companies are asking questions really to kind of understand what is it about my product that I can do so that I can have people keep returning to my to my site or my app or whatever the case may be. Um, how do I make it? How do what do I do to to just have that great experience, right? And really, what's driving that great experience? Um, so, Dana, if you get a chance, I would advise you to listen to this her talk. Um, and I, I think the things that resonated most with me is that. It's not that the, the methods are imperfect. That they, that they, they, they've never always been perfect, but um, they really haven't been enough. And, and I think um, we just heard from, from Toby about how, you know, at the end of the, his, his takeaways, he said uh, that, you know, you, there's not one solution. That you, there's sort of, you have to kind of make some try to habits. And really what a lot of the research firms that you're trying, you know, you're going to hire, it, it, it's not very difficult to run your own unmoderated study by yourself. It's not difficult to even run a study in, in a lab. Quite frankly, it's, it's as, as um, uh, Steve Krug says, it's not rocket science, okay? So that's, that's, that's out there. But the, what you get with values of companies like Moral New Media and Keylime Interactive is that you're getting really uh, expertise of trying to answer questions that you're not going to get just by doing the study yourself. And, and so with that, um, I'm going to talk through some hybrid approaches that I've seen that we do and we've seen other you know, consultancies do, which are trying to get a little bit at the second layer, a little lower layer of answering the questions that we're seeing coming up now. And before I do that, um, well, I'm going to do this and then I'll tell you a little story. So the first one that um, we developed in this, early in the day when we started in 2009, we, we had did some work for THQ. They're no longer around, um, but they're a gaming company. And we, um, we needed, you know, when you do gaming studies, um, you want to do, you usually sometimes do uh, studies in, in groups or whatever the case, multiplayer studies, et cetera. We started having a, we, uh, while, we, when we did these types of studies, we sometimes do, did two users, three users, you know, playing at once. But on our more financial and other types of clients, we started seeing a need where they needed to get results quickly. They didn't want to run an unmoderated study because they wanted to control, and they didn't want their prototype to be seen by half the world. They don't have control in that perspective. So they still wanted to be in the lab, but they wanted us to run 40, 50 sessions because they wanted the quantitative data. They wanted to be able to show their bosses that, hey, yes, this is this design is good to go. And so, so what did that present to researchers? We were in labs for two, three weeks, and you're like, oh my goodness, this is never gonna end, and seeing one after the other, and one after the other. So um, I, we came up with a solution that really is, what it, what it does is I bring in four participants at once, and in my case now with the mobile, I will have them using the Clue app, which is what, I, the, what we developed, and we have them do an unmoderated approach. So at the beginning, I'm, I'm there, and I let them naturally do a series of tasks, um, I'm watching them. In the back room, I can reflect the four screens and watch where they're doing. But what the beauty of this is that this, uh, then I can pick on one or two, whoever I want to pick on, and say, wait a minute, this time around, this person's doing this, and I'm not understanding why. Even if they're, you know, whatever the case may be, I need to understand why that's happening. So I can get the qualitative that I need, which I wouldn't get necessarily if I was doing just strictly a non-moderated approach. The beauty of it is I run four people at a time, five sessions a day, I get 20 people a day, 
two days, I'm 40 people in, I'm like, bonus. So it, it was great. So, so um, what's nice is this, if you're doing an agile approach, then you know, I'm, they're not waiting forever for the results. They get to see it pretty quickly. They have 40 people and they're happy to go. So that was it. Now, I think um, Wiley also described this. So this is the other thing that we have found. Um, some clients love to be in the lab. They want to be able to observe. But the reality of things is that you sometimes need those environmental conditions. You want to see what, what, is, what is happening when people are in the real world using your app. So um, typically we'll recommend if we're testing a mobile app, and we've done it here in New York and it's kind of funny, we'll have people wear, we use the SMI eyeglasses, which is very similar to Toby's solution, and we have them using the glasses, say doing a banking study or a shopping study. And we will do a series of tasks and say, hey, you need to find the closest ATM and you need to use the app. And we'll have them, we'll obviously place them where there's close enough for ATM, they don't walk across the city, but, but what you wanna do there is you wanna see how the, the lighting of the app works out. You wanna see what noise can cause. You wanna do distractors, people t get more relaxed. They're a lot more into the, the app and really how they're doing it. And you'll get things you'll never get in the lab. Granted, some clients still wanna see certain things and you have to kind of sit through that lab variant, but you, getting a play of both really plays out in telling you the full story. So the other thing that we've been doing, and we do this, we, we do a series of, of uh, syndicated studies which we sell in different industries, the auto insurance one being uh, one of the most popular ones, also the banking one. And more recently, we did one with uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, social, social buying apps such as Gilt and uh, Living Social. And you may have been part of the a session that we did Tuesday or Wednesday, I can't remember this week on that. But what we do here is this is more without users. Um, what we do is we know that companies are constantly trying to understand which features should we use? Which ones should we um, try to, I want to make sure that wasn't me. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, the, uh, they're trying to, to resolve, what do we build? We can, we can look at what our competitors do. They're doing all these things, but what's important to users? Um, and, and they're constantly trying to get challenged with that question. And, and your executives are like, well, add this feature, add that feature, add this other feature. And before you know it, you're like, oh my goodness, this thing is so much more difficult to use than that. So what we do is we, we do still do our audit of what features each of the banks have or which features each of the auto insurance companies have, you name it. But we run a study via card sort, okay? And what that card sort study does for us is it's that we give people five buckets and we tell them, hey, I want you to categorize if this is a nice to have feature or is it something that is something that they would differentiate and maybe you would switch banks or whatever the case for and, and really kind of understanding how that plays out. We run, and now our banking study does like over 100 features because if you have a USAA account, they are doing a phenomenal job at adding a lot of features that are really neat and that, that you know, so we want to make sure that we validate some of these because we don't want everyone to be building 100 different features just because one bank is doing it. But you want to know which ones of those should we try to cherry pick, right? And we, we, we want to know which ones are the ones that that are things that people are maybe not doing that you should be doing because there's what we do with this is because we're running it on a in this case either quarterly or biannual process we're getting uh, answers to consumers needs because we'll ask them a question like what do you wish you had in your banking app what do you get frustrated with and we get new things that are not part of that list and we start playing out new variances of things what we do at the end is we we um we use these two and create like almost like a weighted average and we create a report on it. But it's beautiful because now banks or insurance companies or you name it, um, companies can, can look at how they rate, and, but they don't just have data about you know, me as an expert, what I think. They have data that says, hey, 500 users say this and banking wants 750 users. This is what's important. This is the ones I got to cherry pick. The other thing that, um, that we love doing lately, and it's really been helpful, especially when we do healthcare studies, is really around um, co-browsing, right? So if you have an ailment, um, you usually have a caregiver or some sort, someone that's gonna be helping you with that. Um, and so that interaction, especially when someone finds out that they have a terminal illness or they have something that's gonna be a lifetime kind of illness, knowing that relationship and how two people use that app together is very interesting and very needed for you as a as a company who's trying to understand um, what's important and what 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 kind of interactions are happening. 
We do it similarly for banking. We'll look, at, we'll look at husband and wife combinations because quite frankly, if you're sharing your bank account, you're looking to do different things and there's needs that you might have as a couple um, or maybe a parent and a college student kind of relationship. And then we'll do the same thing with shopping. We've done some shop lines where we have two friends going together and there's interactions that, that are just, you would not catch with one person. That layer is interesting because mobile in reality can get very social very quickly. And so having that full spectrum of what can be happening around your app can give you a, an experience which is superior to your competitors. Then one that I recently um, started doing, um, which I found to be very interesting, and it was used in this case with a, a diet and exercising uh, logging application, is that I had a combination of different other methods. So when I brought the participants first into a session and I showed them a, a sort of a beta version of this app, right? Then we went ahead and said, hey, we're gonna want you to use this over the next two weeks. We want you to log exercise and log your diet over the next two weeks. And then I'm gonna text you from time to time, because I had obviously access to this, this panel of users, and I'm gonna ask you how it's going. And, I need, and I'm gonna ask you different questions about your experience and interaction, et cetera. So I had timely input from different users through time about their interaction, where things were frustrating, et cetera. And then I came back after I had everybody's data and said, okay, I'm gonna circle back and I'm gonna just do some in-depth interviews with you know, trying to kind of not resolve some information that wasn't clear to me and just kept more of the story around things. And so um, it helped me contextualize the experience through time and what were the frustrations. And the reason why I, I, there's something here that really caught my eye and this is, this is sort of where I'm at mentally because I have found in, I guess in the last year is that when people start doing workarounds in your app, those are opportunities for you to really, uh, as, a, as an app developer or you know, site developer, to really capitalize on. Case in point, I'll tell you the story now. So we ran a, a study recently where we're looking at two different apps and we, um, there was a feature, and, 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 it's, and I, I publicly said this recently, but um, if you use Gilt, uh, the application to do shopping, um, you uh, are able to set reminders of, hey, I want to, um, I want to be reminded when the sale starts. Great, that's a great feature to have. But if you use apps such as social, uh, Living Social or Groupon, you will, um, you may want to get informed that, hey, I like this um, um, deal that's gonna be happening and, and it's, um, it's gonna close in two days, but I need to talk to my friend because I wanna go to this event, I wanna make sure she's gonna be able to go with me or he's gonna be able to go with me. So I'm gonna, I wanna remind myself. Neither of those apps have the feature to say, hey, and I know it's timely and they want you to buy it at that point, from, but from a consumer perspective, I'm sure we've all been there, you almost want that and you're gonna do a workaround. Just very similarly, like sometimes you're doing shopping online and you, you're putting things into your shopping cart just because you want a place to be able to hold some things as you're trying to figure out what's important. And from a technology perspective, the, the, the actual client is wondering, why is our shopping cart abandoned so high? It's because you don't have certain features and functions. And, and so, um, Having those types of features that really solve those workarounds that we all get very frustrated on is, is what makes great experiences, is what differentiates one experience from the other. And knowing how to find the right ones is, is really um, only something that you can get through some user research, whether it's you're gonna quantify it in a lab study or you're gonna run a, um, some sort of card source, some study to really help you. But you wanna identify those differentiators that People have that, hey, when they get frustrated because they have to do a workaround to do something and one has it and the other one has it, then, then that's an opportunity for you. So that brings me to the, that point, which is what I was trying to say, is that that is something that I, I really think there's a method out there that really is about trying to find those workarounds, trying to find those opportunities, trying to understand what is it about that experience that's going to make you a better app. Um, in case in point. Now I'm stuck, okay. All right, so now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the uh, solution that we have that we've used to, um, to help uh, get some, so what I call some quick and dirty feedback. So um, very similar to what usertesting.com does online in that they allow you to uh, go in there, set up your own study, 
um, run a study and get identify with what are the you know questions issues you know not really running in an environment we've come up with a solution that's really uh, based around mobile and we've used it also in the lab you saw how I used it in the lab but um, what it can do for me is I can set up a study whether it's a competitive study or it's a study that I'm just interested in understanding uh, what is happening and I can launch it in, in, in a couple days have data supporting videos to help me Really, if you want to think about it, a lot of people use this to make their case of why they need to do some more, really what, what are the main issues. And you have somebody else, a third party kind of participant saying that your site is having some deficiencies, et cetera. So I set up a quick study and I'm going to send you, show you a video now. But what this study was, for all you Miami lovers, uh, was really looking at, and this is running during the time that the heat was running, what was uh, uh, LeBron James's um, points per game and so we had a very simple task, one task study, um, and we had them do this, and we can also know what pages they went to, we can also see how, what gestures they were doing, uh, and we really just wanted to kind of gauge really quickly what is ease, efficiency, satisfaction, those three big measures that, and really success of what was happening. Now, because we run a number of studies through time, you're gonna see something here that I, that I have also added, which is the norms. We like to do that to our, and, and provide those. Um, we provide it to our clients and we have access to it. If you're interested in, I'm going to show you the numbers now, but you'll see them. In various different types of technology, we are coll constantly collecting data. And we're, we have a database that allows us to see the last 40 studies that we've done in various uh, industries. And we don't, we have some of them that we can do by industry, but generally speaking, it's you know, just a norm. So you kind of get a pulse because if you think, well, wow, only 40 people thought it was easy. Hmm, that's not good. Wow, only 40 people thought it was efficient. Wow, only, well, 60% are satisfied. That's, that's actually better than the norm. That's actually not that bad, okay? Um, granted, these are lower numbers depending on your end. You kind of find out if it's statistics significant or whatever the case may be. But if you at least can see this, it helps you, gives you a reference point. So with that, I need to show a video. So very similar to what we saw Alfonso do, I'm going to show you this um, one. I think it has audio, it actually does audio. So because you have your phone, you can have audio being picked up. People are doing it at their home. Sometimes you hear the TV in the background, you hear a lot of different noises, but this one I hope it doesn't have that much. So we asked participants to find the thing. All right, so we will be looking for LeBron James's points per game for LeBron and Let's have a look here. Well, I am curious to know if turning the iPad does anything different. It does not. Um, so I'm looking along the top bar because because I don't know. Because maybe yeah, that's where I would start. And we are looking for LeBron James stats. Um, I'm not sure if it looks like this because it's a test site, but the news section down on the bottom left with the blank space to the right of it, that seems kind of weird looking. Um, let's look here. Let's click on MBA. Okay, now I see an ad in that blank space from before. Oh, and apparently I can scroll up and down. Okay, see, I would not have noticed that there was more stuff down here in the bottom. In our case, we have a hand showing. Oh, and there's a thought, player's so. enter last name, <laughs> player tracker, and then there's player stats down at the bottom. Hmm. There's no way I would have seen that right away. Um... So you get the point, and right? So you can see what's happening, and 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 you know these are obviously this is a five-minute video here, and it shows you um, it shows you what's what's uh, what they're thinking, what is the issues. So you, you can see it's, this could be interesting if you're trying to see. Hey, I find certain I'm finding certain things happening on my site. I want to test to see what's happening when people are at home and they're you know what are they thinking. And what's nice is that you're going to get geographic reach. So I can have someone that's in New York. I can have someone that is for all intents and purposes in Spain or wherever you want them to be. And I need to get back. Uh, back. Yeah, there we go. I didn't do that. 
All right, so, so the next one I just want to talk through briefly, it's very similar. We did one for Etsy. And uh, you know we had them look for a specific shirt and, and add it to the shirt. Um, in this case, uh, the ease was about 57%. Um, what we got out of this was really a number of really interesting uh, opportunities and frustrations, um, and I'll just highlight those. Um, there was no description, and if any of you have used this app, there's no description in the search results to make it easier to identify what the product name was and the price, so you kind of have to get deeper, and that really can frustrate some people. And there's, in your favorites, there's really no way to search or sort or do any of that kind of functions, and, and participants really want that. So if I was, if I was Etsy, I I'd can run a couple of sessions, seven sessions, get some really informative opportunities that, that I might be... Um, I have supportive data that I can bring to my leadership to show, hey, these are these are really happening. And, and I mean, granted, you can use this to be one data point. You can then go to the App Store and look at the, the, their comments and add that, become another data set. Um, but you want to add this because if you are trying to make a uh, an argument for, hey, we need to make changes, we, or we really this experience needs to be changed, and here's how guilt does it, or here's how whoever does it better. Um, you want to bring data to support it. And in this case, for you know, for a small, relatively small study, you can look at Etsy, you can look at the competitors and kind of show, well, okay, look at these competitors, look at the, what they do and how they do it better and what look at what people are saying. So that's, that's, that's really the, the, the real uh, wow factor for, for these types of solutions. So I talked a little bit about this, so I'm just going to summarize here um, and really um, bring in a couple of points is that... Um, we, we have norms, and I have them here. Um, we, we, we have, they're usually created based on a seven point scale. So the way I bring them is that every, in every study I'll ask one to seven, how easy is it to use? Um, was it, how quick was it to do? Are you satisfied with it? And I can get um, scores, and I add my sixes and sevens and create a norm for that. Um, and, and that is powerful to have that. So as you run more studies, you, you'll see trends happening through time. And what's nice about it is if you're just trying to do a uh, an understanding of how your improvements are really capitalizing throughout time. Having, you know, what's happening now, and obviously these numbers fluctuate because what happens is that new competitors will put features in and then will shift things one way. There's certain, obviously there's certain apps that have very high numbers versus others that have low numbers. So that, that depends on your industry and there's a variance of things like that. But it, you can show point in time and benchmarking how you can actually, how you're progressing through time. Okay, well that concludes my talk, and I think now we get to do questions, because we're all going to talk. Great, thank you. Very interesting. I'd like to start with one question for Wilkie. I've been dying to ask him this question all, since we knew he was going to be here. We, our firm has used eye tracking back, you know, as late as in the late 70s. And in the last year or so, we sort of cut back on it. And one of the reasons we did was when we did uh, large studies with eye tracking, we discovered that and we would see eye tracking data present uh, in the presentation, but we would go back and we would do a debrief and we realized that the respondents hadn't actually seen the data. So what we begin to see is a difference between actual cognitive awareness and perception, as you see. And I'm just wondering, how do, you, how do you approach that problem from a research point of view? And, and do clients ask you those sorts of questions where you see from the, from the eye tracking data they actually saw something, but their cognitive integration wasn't present? Yeah, uh, that, that is one of the central questions of, uh, of, of um, eye tracking applications. Um, the, the, the point is there, there is a, a, a real difference between not seeing, not looking at something, and seeing something and then really not registering it. So in that latter case, it's sort of in one eye and out the other. Um, eye tracking, uh, it, it, one approach to sort of disambiguating that, well, there's, 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 a, there's a theoretical approach that's more rigorous, and that is to, is, to, is to dig fairly deeply into an analysis of the eye tracking metrics. That's uh, challenging to do. Um, the other approach, which is more practical, is to actually start to triangulate eye tracking along with these other measures so that when you get these sort of disconnects like, oh, 70 percent of the people laid eyes on this feature, but yet only 20 percent of them recalled anything about it. 
then you can use that information to sort of circle back to the eye tracking metrics to see, you know, uh, in a sense, um, what is that, um, what is that metric value that indicates perception or processing at this point? So, the, tech, the technical answer is that it's it's usually in the eye tracking measurements, the the, the deep eye tracking measurements in some sense, but uh, you for most practical applications, you're going to actually be um, using eye tracking not in isolation, but in conjunction, in triangulation mode with other methodologies out there. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Questions? Yes. yes. So I've read about it the other way as well. So driving researchers who use eye tracking will tell you that very often people never look at the traffic light, but they stop at red lights and they go with green lights. Mm -hmm. So the behavior is saying that they're actually registering it, but the eye tracking is not registering it. Have, have you, well, how much does that happen? That, that's, that's actually pretty straightforward uh, in, the sen in the sense that what eye tracking measures is line of sight vision. So it's that central portion of the visual field that eye tracking measures. So if you stick your arm out in full length and look at your thumbnail, sorry, okay, that is actually the size uh, of the area that's resolved by a central visual field. So if I'm driving along and I'm looking at my dashboard or the car in front of me, the traffic light is up here in my parafoveal or near peripheral. I don't need to fixate on it. It would never be measurable. I can attend to things that are outside of my measurable central visual field, uh, meaning with the attention of the mind, but you'd never be able to measure it. You can make use of vision out. Yeah, yeah. These, yes. these researchers were pretty uh, sophisticated, and they, they, they were saying it wasn't even peripheral. But anyway. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, that's was, interesting. it was really an interesting yeah. paper. Sure. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, um, just a, a quick question on that last part. Uh, where the comment that I talked about? My question is for... Um, Ania. Sorry. Annie. Just make no, it easy. Oh, or Alfonso. Alfonso, thank you. <laughs> uh, but, 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 um, sorry, we forgot the name card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, as far as, like, the tracking is concerned, you know, I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking, well, don't some people have better abilities at scanning things than others, and are able to pick up things faster than others. Uh, I mean, just to throw that, because I was thinking, I mountain bike. So when I mountain bike, I see a lot of things really quick. Maybe I develop the skill to scan things quickly than other people who don't mountain bike. Uh, is there something in there? Uh, and, and kind of related to that is the question of qualifying your users. and. Alfonso, when you, when you were talking about yours, going through the, the process, you kind of, the steps kind of seem like they qualify the users a little bit. Is there any way to do that before? Because if you're getting unqualified users to go ahead and go through the process, you really kind of waste money in a way. Is there any way to do that? And just really in general, I mean, I really didn't hear that much talk about qualified users. I mean, even with the MBA app, I mean, who are you asking? Are you asking an NBA fan? Doesn't that matter? Or you're asking, you know, uh, a housewife who watches, I don't know, Mario Children. Well, I think Alfonso probably has a good answer to that because he manages very large panels through large samples. So, Absolutely. and Ania does as well. So. Yeah, and um, can you hear me well? Sure. Um, I, I actually made, made the point, because uh, you're totally right. If you don't use the right panel or the right set of users, forget about the researcher, how good they are. Well, that's, that's part of the research process, right? So right off the front, I'm going to ask, are we, who is our target? target? What, is, what, what are we trying to find? Are we looking for a general consumer? Or are we looking for a sports fan? Are we looking for someone who is um, in the U.S., or do we want somebody who's an expat, who's into soccer, or whatever the case may be, because we're looking for certain demographics? Um, and and, and that's, that's easy to resolve. You Basically, when you're putting together that study, you're going to, uh, you, whether you're using eye tracking or using a quantitative method, you're going to specify that as a requirement, and they're going to screen participants based on those specific requirements that you put together. And yeah, it's called it's called screener, right? So you um, <coughs> you can ask them a series of questions, and there's a little bit of a science on, you know, trying not, to not leading, avoiding, yeah, avoiding that they get in even if they're not really qualified. Um, so in our case, yeah, I mean, we work with the panel companies that I mentioned earlier. You know, Server Sampling International, Research Now, Toluna, Sint, 
Uh, there's a whole bunch of panel companies. It's it's ama amazing. I went to this market research, pure market research, um, a conference last year. Not so much UX or usability, but but market research called SMR Congress. And I I was surprised. There was like maybe I mean, twenty of panel companies, small ones, big ones like the ones we use, uh, local ones specialized in healthcare, specialized in this. I, I, it was the the not the the um, I think if there was a hundred companies, I think the biggest percentage of type of company was panel, mm -hmm. and I think the reason why that is is because it's so important as you mentioned, and because there's a there's a science there's a process, we we uh, we have um, we ask our panel um, vendors to be very strict when it comes to the quality. Um, of the of the pe people that participate, they they do all kinds of um, ma they have management of the users. They they call them often. They they follow up. They make sure they're not cheaters. Um, there's also cheaters and, and speeders controls in, in in for example in users and we activate those. So if you actually go through really quickly, the system automatically disqualifies you. Or if you try if you go through and you don't click anywhere and you're supposed to click at least you know a few times to find the information. Uh, you're also disqualified, you know. So, I think in research, mm, you you could have a whole talk dedicated to quality controls for the you know for the panelists or for the participants and the screeners and and all those things that you need to do because otherwise, again, consultants being great, technology being great, it doesn't matter, you know. Another question? Mm -hmm. Yes. For Wally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Wilkie. Wilkie. Okay. Yeah. A couple years ago, when Pam came up with the stylus and everything. Every time you use it, you had to collaborate. You had to choose the four corners so they will. Yeah, that's you. that was. How do you collaborate with the eyes? How calibrate. do you know? Calibrate. Yeah. Calibrate. Where you're looking. Oh. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the principle is the same for most eye tracking systems out there, and that is, you're asked to look in certain areas, and the system knows where you're supposed to be looking. It calculates where you deviate, how, in what way you deviate from where your eye is supposed to be looking, and that's your correction. So, for example, if this was where I was supposed to be looking, uh, but I measured my eye's visual axis is out here, it would apply a correction to bring the, that data point in line. It's, in essence, that's, that's it. It's fairly straightforward. They've gotten very sophisticated over the years in that perspective. M much more so. Yeah. But conceptually simple. Yeah. 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 Is it more difficult to calibrate the glasses than uh, standard trackers? I don't know. No, it's gotten it's got a lot easier. I mean, like you, it, I don't know. I mean, I know that at one point you had the markers. Do you still have markers or no? Do you have like the four markers? Uh, well, uh, yeah. Those those aren't really used for calibration, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. Mm. But I mean, there's I I know that at least when I use the SMI glasses, they just they have you know one point and or three point calibration, and you just set it, and we you have them look at hey, I'm going to look at the corner here, and it could be any object you want to put it at, and then mm. you just calibrate to to that. And I personally am looking forward to you know even more sophisticated calibration on smaller devices because I believe that pretty soon maybe you can answer that uh, uh, there will be eye tracking capabilities on webcams uh, from you know on a laptop or the smaller ones and if you can do that i know i know it's still a ways to go but once you do that then you can test remotely with user zoom and add the eye tracking uh, data on top right, so, then mm -hmm. that's, so if there's no eye tracking right now that's using the webcam on the laptops or anything like that you yeah, have a solution there are. Yeah. There, there are uh, when you do uh, let's say a webcam interview they always tell you to look at the camera and not look at the people because if you, mm -hmm. when you look at the screen, they don't see your eyes. So I'm thinking, how do you use the, how do you use the camera to look at the eyes and say where the eyes are looking at on the screen? It's, it seems a little complex to me. Well, there are there are commercial systems out there that, that do webcam eye tracking. It's it's a different thing than than true hardware eye tracking because yeah. the precision is not not there. Yeah. But there are there are companies out there right now that you could go contract to do a study through a webcam. But it, you should you should not expect that it would give you the precision or accuracy that that you would get from a, a bona fide hardware eye tracker. Um, and you have and if you if you're going to go that way, you have to make some fairly careful calculations as to how many participants you want to run. 
know, what the cost per participant is going to be, how much data you can you can comp, you can tolerate throwing out, um, the resolution of the features you're looking at. If you're interested in looking at you know um, a top menu bar that's got seven items and they're 40 pixels wide, you, you won't capture that with webcam eye tracking, but you will capture that with any one of the hardware eye tracking systems out there. I can add question in the back. Um, you guys are talking about different systems and how precise they are. And I guess I'm in the feeling that in the field there doesn't seem to be like a standard to how calibrated or how precise they need to be in order for the data to be considered valid. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys have an idea of like where that level is, if there is actually a standard out there. Because I guess I'm a little confused on what level of accuracy is considered to be acceptable with doing research. Because anybody could use, like when you said the webcam ones, they might not be precise then how can they claim that data is correct if it's so imprecise? I understand for like general stuff you can use it, but I'm just curious where you guys feel that level is because I have a feeling that's an issue in the field. Uh, well, uh, to Toby, Toby has run a metric study, and what, it, what, it seeks to, what that study seeks to do is to standardize the conditions under which accuracy measurements are calculated. So we've tested all of our own eye trackers, and we think we've come up with sort of a... Uh, uh, an agnostic method to validate accuracy calibrations. But it, practically speaking, when you're talking about running an eye tracking test, you really have two, two limitations. You've got the hardware resolution limitation, and you've got human vision limitation. So if you're, if you're looking within about a degree or so, you could be looking at the left side of that one degree span or the right side of that one degree span. And while the hardware could resolve it, it might not make any difference to you because perceptually they're both part of that, you know, of that thumbnail size field of view that you can extract the information you need to get uh, to execute the task. So, in what I'm saying is, that in, in practical uh, uh, in practical applications, you have to consider the size, of the, the minimum size of the features you're interested in. Is it a large left nav element, or is it the actual dots that you flick to see what page you're on? Um, and how precise you, you need to be able to make those determinations of looking at this versus that. Um, in general, um, it's the hardware that's going to uh, be more precise than the eye. So it, it really comes down to, in that case, defining your, your test methodology, because the hardware will, pr will get, probably get you all the accuracy you're ever going to need. Uh, then it's going to come down to your methodology and, and the way you test. Another question? One more. So, Alfonso, um, is there any industry direction as far as automating the user experience? Because like, in the older computing scenarios where you had the standard desktop, you had situations where you could simulate a user, and just punch through a couple thousand yeah. web clicks and simulate them, capture the logs behind and see. This one was successful, etc. From a mobile point of view, even though you have the users going through the URL, does anybody envision automating that and then capturing logs to see what failed and what didn't fail? As far as did you get to the, I don't know what the example was, find the, the size of this or something, whatever the test was that's designed, is anybody automating that from a yeah, there's plenty of that. solutions. Performance testing is really what he's getting at. There's, that's, that's a little bit of a different, so that, that's a little bit different from the, the research, which is more that, you know, typically you use with like an Alfonso solution, which is user-based or, or a clue, which is user-based. And what you're discussing is more of the automated performance testing. So you're testing to make sure that pages are loading, how long they're loading, is a task failing along the way because of, of whatever the reason may be a, 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 a link that's broken, whatever the case may be. Um, there's a, there's already a number of, of um, companies out there. Keynote is one. Uh, Gomez, if they're still around. Smart Bear, which used to be Alert Site, um, that do that, and they do it in mobile as well. So this is tricky. Just that's user, how the person well, to <clears throat> you know how at the beginning we were talking about what are your goals. I think we the, all of us mentioned that you know depending on your goals, you need to use the right tool or even a you know combination uh, a combination. Um, 
because the fact is research is, is, is complicated and user experience as a concept is complicated. You know, like what is user experience? If you start thinking about the definition of it, you know, you start thinking it, it's not just usability. So you're going to have to use the is performance testing part of, part of the user experience? Absolutely. How long does it take? You know, is it fast? I, I don't think, I wasn't thinking, but I, I was thinking the problem with testing, but I was thinking, you will add it, you never trust the user. So I was trying to think, I guess, how could you make it more scientific and not be pain on the user or anything else? I think, unfortunately, in, in the case of usability, and, you know, we were talking a lot about usability today, being a, a, an important part of, or aspect of, of, of user experience, uh, see, the definition says, it's the degree, and there's plenty of them, but the IO, the, the international standard says, the degree to which a product can be used in a, um, a specific context um, by a specific type of user uh, trying to complete a specific t number of tasks or specific tasks or goals. And that's sort of how it's internationally, you know, accepted as a definition. And if you think about that definition, it's really difficult if not impossible, I would say, actually, to automate. You have to be user, you have to ask a certain group of users with a specific profile, like we were talking about, you need to qualify a group of, of users and understand that that's, that's the right sample. You need to have them go through goals or scenarios or tasks, you know, um, in order to evaluate the effectiveness and the efficiency. And then you also want to, you know, look at the context. And we spoke about context again today. All those things are part of the, of the definition. It's, I would say, impossible to automate all of that. I mean, w what we're doing at UserZoom is trying to uh, automate as much. Uh, so, for example, you can avoid the moderation or, or, you know, just... But that's about it for now. I think in terms of trends, which is a question that you had, and, you know, like, I, I think that technology will do a lot more than what the human is doing and have the human or the researcher, designer, uh, concentrate on interpreting, interpreting the data and, 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 and being creative. I mean, I think, you know, Anya has shown you can be really creative with research, you know, by combining stuff and, and you know, putting something in the street or whatever. One, just one point I want to make, and there is actually a startup in, in California. Uh, I think they're based out of Stanford, and they're developing an algorithm-based user. And essentially, they're doing what you're talking about. They're taking data from millions of data points and interviews and the structure of the cognitive processes and navigation, and they're developing an algorithm that they're going to apply against this. Now, what uh, the panelists are talking about is what's happening today you know, on the ground, and this is really the way the work is done today, and it's probably the way it's going to be done for the next 10 years. But there's interest. I mean, Bonnie actually... Uh, you could go back and see the talk that I gave back in, when was it, September? That's right. On um, human performance modeling that's predictive yeah. And it's simulated humans. Yeah, that actually. Still on YouTube? Mm -hmm. is it still up? Is it still it's on, on YouTube, yeah. right? Yeah, it's on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Actually, there's some great lectures there, and this one will be up uh, in a couple of weeks. But uh, this is Bonnie John. She gave a lecture on cognitive modeling and on a tool that she developed, Cog Tools. And it's, it is an algorithm based model for performance, human performance. Okay, any other questions? Everybody ready to go home? Okay, we'll see you in September. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.